Okay, so we will start. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so uh, I guess we have motivated ourselves enough with the two case studies, uh, and therefore now we can proceed to the main segments of this course. So uh, before I start off with, uh, I'll just give you a short outline of how this course will proceed roughly, tentatively. So the first segment will be FairML. Here there will be two parts. In one, we will talk about definitions that are required to build fair ML systems and then ML algorithms with fairness objective. Then the next segment will be content governance. So here again we will do one audit study. And then this will be followed by. Hate speech. Analysis. And. Fake. News. misinformation analysis. Then after this, we will go into media bias. The next segment will be on explainability. And finally, we will wrap up the syllabus with moral machines. So this is going to be the rough structure of our overall syllabus and majority of the invited talks will be in this segment. OK, so as I said that we will start off with fair ML. And one of the major segments under this fair ML is to understand the various definitions okay, that will be required throughout the discussion of the ML algorithms. So the first thing that we would like to get ourselves introduced to is sensitive attribute. OK, so uh, uh, what in your opinion is a sensitive attribute? Any thoughts on this? Does this name ring a bell? Nothing. OK, so let me pull off the carton. So attributes that a respondent will typically not like to disclose when some data about them 
is collected, curated, either online or through surveys. So these are some of the attributes which a respondent would typically like to hide okay, uh, and would not uh, be interested to share with the public. Okay, so uh, can you think of some examples? Natural examples that come to your mind, which could be thought of as sensitive attributes. Uh, like race, uh, gender, race, criminal background, and also gender. Okay, criminal background. Okay, very good. This will do. Now, people like possessing one of these sensitive attributes, one or more of these sensitive attributes are said to belong to something called a protected class. Okay. Individuals belonging or having one or more of these sensitive attributes are said to be part of a protected class. So very often we will refer to sensitive attributes and protected class in the rest of the discussion about fair ML. Okay. So now we need some standards, right? We need some standards to define sensitive attributes. Okay, so uh, typically like uh, some of the standards that the fair ML literature has predominantly followed mainly because most of the studies were done in the US in the uh, beginning. Uh, I mean, at least at the uh, during the inception of this course, or during the inception of this uh, uh, research area. Uh, so most of the uh, definitions of sensitive attribute have been adapted using the um, US guidelines. And there are two famous guidelines that has been generally followed in the literature. One is the fair housing guideline And the other is the equal credit opportunity acts. So these are the two famous guidelines which people have generally followed to define sensitive attributes. Now, according to the fair housing guideline, some of the sensitive attributes are, as you have already pointed out, race, color, national origin, religion, Sex, familial status, disability. Now, according to the equal credit opportunity, also, race is a sensitive attribute, 
color is a sensitive attribute national origin is a sensitive attribute religion is a sensitive attribute sex is a sensitive attribute familial status is not disability is not status is a sensitive attribute is an additional sensitive attribute okay according to the ecoa so overall you see you have a flavor of like some of the important sensitive attributes okay however like the moment the demography changes for instance if you think of india like there are certain omissions there are certain glaring omissions that you already observe here okay so uh, can you name at least one one glaring omission if india is considered uh, sir caste i think caste anything else that comes to your mind india specific caste anything else socio economic background somehow this is something very highly sensitive in the indian context okay so now why did we define sensitive attributes because we have to notionally formalize three concepts discrimination bias and fairness and all these three terminologies are actually with respect to with respect to some sensitive attribute okay so none of these terminologies could be defined without the sensitive attribute in place okay so discrimination bias and fairness are interrelated concepts and none of these could be defined without the presence of one or more sensitive attributes and they are all interrelated okay all of these are interrelated with each other and we will see how okay so we will start with notions of discrimination by the way so uh, all these sensitive attributes that you see like who is going to impose this or who is going to actually be a guardian that these are going to be sensitive attributes who do you think or which body do you think would be should be responsible or should be the guardian for this kind of sensitive attributes mm. judicial system like it yes. should be legally the judiciary and here comes all the law ideas judiciary is the guardian okay judiciary is the guardian that imposes legal regulations
okay that imposes the legal regulations in order to in order to prevent discrimination discrimination based on these attributes right so this is what the judiciary actually plays a role in so now therefore all the notions of discrimination that we are going to discuss uh, are inspired by the judicial thoughts okay we will specifically talk about three different types of discrimination broadly the first one is called disparate treatment the second one is called disparate impact and the third one is disparate mistreatment so we will start off with disparate treatment okay so disparate treatment actually tells that if similarly situated individuals are differentially treated then this results in a disparate treatment okay so similarly situated individuals this could be situated in a uh, job sector situated in society situated in an uh, university like the situation could vary okay this is contextual but they should be similarly situated so similarly situated situated individuals are differentially treated okay so this is the basic idea of disparate treatment now this has two broad categories okay the disparate treatment actually has two broad categories of discrimination the first one is called formal discrimination and the second one is called intentional discrimination so what is a formal discrimination formal discrimination is direct denial of opportunities okay direct denial of opportunities based on the protected class and most often this direct denial is reasoned out by a very like creepy kind of reasoning and this is called rational racism any of you have heard about this term okay so this is probably something 
pretty new and like very specific to this course. So this actually comes up from the hypothesis of naturalistic fallacy. Now, what does naturalistic fallacy state? Naturalistic fallacy tells that something that looks natural should be, you know, morally grounded, should be ethical. So something which you find to be natural should be actually morally correct or morally grounded, okay, or ethically correct. Now, for example, one can think of a situation that there is some sort of an emergency or a disaster uh, in a nation. So, and a natural thing that one could think of would be to leave away all the old and the disabled people to die off. Okay? Because if you calculate the profit and loss, then the cost to rescue these people is much more than the benefit that they're going to bring to the country at an aggregate level after they are rescued. Okay, so this kind of natural uh, kind of reasoning actually is sometimes thought to be morally correct. But if you understand this, I mean, I guess almost all of you will agree that this kind of a decision is appalling, right? So this is what is naturalistic fallacy. So anything that appears natural might not be actually morally grounded or correct okay so any other any other similar situation that you can think of let's do this exercise looking at our surroundings some other examples of naturalistic philosophy uh, so, sorry naturalistic fallacy which we very often like you know land up to Is the idea clear? Is the idea of naturalistic fallacy clear? If you keep quiet, then I will uh, assume that it's not clear. So if you have any Next. queries, please ask. If you have any doubts, please ask. Uh, like say, saying something like women shouldn't go outside at night because it is not safe is like not very good. Very good point. So this is a naturalistic fallacy. This is actually a very good naturalistic fallacy example uh, in say possibly context of India. OK, so another example that I can give you is that, uh, you know, one might say that all the uh, uh, mentally retarded kids, all the kids that are born mentally retarded, should be euthanized because the practical benefits that they're going to bring when they grow up uh, is like much less than the cost that needs to be incurred to uh, save them or give them uh, adequate protection by the nation. So these are some of the appalling natural like uh, arguments which do not seem to be morally or ethically grounded. I mean, as per any societal norms, uh, one would imagine that these are not morally or ethically grounded. Okay, so now from this naturalistic uh, fallacy comes the idea of rational racism. What is this? Now this this is one step further. This says that if you have empirical evidence, okay, then if you have empirical evidence of something occurring multiple times, then that should be morally correct. Okay. So empirical evidence is something that should justify the morality of an action. Okay, so that's the idea. So, so rational racism is where 
empirical evidence is used to justify that an action is morally correct. Okay. So one example, of course, in the US context is the following that African Americans are typically called blacks are genetically or culturally prone to be criminals mainly because of their overpopulation in jails. So the overpopulation in jails overpopulation in jails is the empirical evidence okay, that is being used as a weaponry to state that blacks are culturally or even sometimes genetically prone to grow as criminals. Right. So this is the kind of rational racism argument. So uh, therefore, I, yes. Um, is it uh, considered as justified if um, there is um, um, if there is an empirical reason? That is what. So that is not morally correct. OK, so that's why it is called rational racism. So uh, an employer might, you know, as well cite this reason that, OK, there is overpopulation of um, uh, black people in jails, and therefore I understand that uh, blacks would be uh, criminals uh, genetically or culturally, and therefore I'm not going to hire that person. So this is legally incorrect. Okay. So rational racism is legal. That's why we call it a discrimination. Okay. So rational racism is a form of discrimination. If you recall, we are studying disparate treatment under which we have this formal discrimination and rational racism is cited sometimes as a reason, used to be cited as a reason for discrimination, okay? Just to just justify a discrimination, okay? Which is like morally completely incorrect and nowadays even ethically and legally barred. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, thank you. Yeah, so now again, I'll get back to you on asking you a similar situation that we face in the Indian context. Any thoughts? Like based on caste, we untouchability sort of like some very caste. good. Excellent point. So untouchability is one of the important like uh, like um, ways of uh, justifying like uh, the casteism. Okay, so that that has been there like for ages and therefore there is a law in the uh, Indian penal code system which bars the use of untouchability or the concept of untouchability. Okay. Okay, so that was all about the formal discrimination. Now we will talk about intentional discrimination. Now this is based on the idea of burden shifting. There is a like 
kind of a toggling okay or a tug of war like which is better termed as burden shifting of events in case of intentional discrimination okay so we will take an example of the uh, job scenario okay and uh, try to explain the idea of intentional discrimination okay so here we will assume an employee to be a plaintiff you see we have started using law terms and an employer to be a defendant okay so the idea is as follows now the plaintiff actually has the responsibility to show or to bring up evidence that similarly situated individuals which do not who do not belong to the protected class did not suffer the same uh, like uh, uh, issues that the plaintiff had to suffer okay being from the protective class or protected class okay so the idea is that the plaintiff will have the responsibility to gather evidence to show that a similarly situated individual not belonging to the protected class did not suffer from the same discrimination as that of the plaintiff okay now uh, what could be the kind of discriminations this could be like if we are taking the job scenario this could be like you know in hiring discrimination in hiring discrimination in promotion etc okay so the plaintiff has to bring up evidence that the discrimination that he or she has suffered has not been suffered by a similarly situated individual okay who does not belong to the protected class fine so this is what the plaintiff has to bring up now once the plaintiff has brought up this so these are like irregularities or discriminations once the plaintiff has brought up this evidence now the burden shifts this is why we call it a burden shift of events now the burden shifts to the defendant and the defendant has to come up with a with an argument that the discrimination that is observed is because of a specific company policy and it's not a like uh, you know uh, intentional discrimination fine so the defendant has to come up with an argument that the visible irregularity
is due to an unavoidable company policy. Right? So this is what the defendant has to come up with. Now, in this particular case, the defendant does not have the liability to go and prove this. Okay, he will just say he or she will just cite. Okay, there is a company policy. Now, this company policy actually tells me that I cannot like promote someone or uh, hire someone based on these 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 factors because this is you see in this way this is legitimate. When this account has been submitted by the defendant, then the burden again shifts back to the plaintiff. And the plaintiff now has the responsibility to show that the defendant account is not legitimate. So in the court of law, it is the plaintiff's uh, liability to prove that the evidence provided or the account provided by the defendant is not legitimate. This is not like something that the defendant need to prove, needs to prove. He, will, he or she will cite some policies, some accounts, make an account, okay? That okay, so these are the, the so and so are the reasons why uh, this there is a uh, like uh, delay in the promotion or such and such person has not been hired. Okay, now it comes on the plaintiff to like drag it to the court of law and to uh, establish lawfully that the defendant's account is not legitimate. Okay, so these are the two different forms of disparate treatment. Okay. So these are very important concepts. Whenever we will be like designing our fair ML um, algorithms, we will see how some of these are quantified. So the notions should be very, very clear to you. So if you have any doubts, please ask. So could an example of this be um, say, Promotion of women in companies. Of course, this is a subset example. Okay. Promotion in general. So you see, I said promotion in general. So this promotion could be like based on any sensitive attribute, as I said, protected class. And the protected yeah. class could be gender, okay, could be race, could be age. Okay. So based on the, the company policies, they cannot say promote um, specific genders, races or people of certain. Yeah, age. so they will cite some company policy uh, telling that, OK, uh, say so. So these are very tricky things. Uh, there was this uh, American company uh, which cited that, uh, you know, um, uh, women of a certain age are uh, incapable of, so, so these there are two predicted attributes here. So the gender as well as the age are incapable of holding any position above a particular uh, tire of uh, like uh, promotion because of the nature of the job. And they cited some X Y Z nature of the job, which which like you know if you if you give to a medical practitioner, the medical practitioner also might come up with a similar justification. So these are very crooked and creepy kind of things that go on. OK, and now once this account has been given, it the liability comes entirely on the employee to prove that, OK, this is not legitimate. Making sense? Yes, sir. OK, so now the other form, the second form is disparate impact. 
so here the discrimination is not intentional okay but the discrimination manifests in the outcome okay the discrimination manifests in the outcome although there is no discrimination in the import although there is no discrimination in the import the discrimination somehow manifests in the outcome okay now here the situation changes okay here the defendant okay puts up an account again that the discriminatory outcome is because of some company policy now at this point the plaintiff has the liberty to challenge this account account and point out a policy that could be far more non discriminatory now you see there is a role reversal here so the defendant puts up an account that okay this discrimination that you see in the uh, outcome is because of a company policy now the plaintiff here will just simply challenge that this account is uh, you know is biased is discriminatory and i can think of a policy or a revision in the policy which would be ap equally applicable and much less discriminatory now once the plaintiff comes up with such a description of a new policy it depends now the burden shifts on the defendant shifts on the defendant and the defendant has to prove his her court case okay so like in the earlier case the plaintiff was having the liability to prove that uh, something was discriminatory in the intentional discrimination case here in disparate impact it is the dis defendant who has to defend himself or herself okay the plaintiff has just the responsibility to point out to an alternative policy there the work of the plaintiff stops or ends now the defendant so this will be placed in the court of law now the defendant has the responsibility to prove his or her point okay so this is how the two ideas the disparate treatment and the disparate impact are notionally different and then finally we have disparate mistreatment okay so now sometimes disparate impact is justified okay based on historical ground truth data
So remember, all these things that we are discussing, this discrimination could be done by a physical employer or it could be as well an algorithm because these days many of the promotion and hiring decisions as you will appreciate are actually taken in completely automatic or semi-automatic ways i guess you are aware of like um, softwares which can very well do cv screening okay so and similarly like given employee records like a software can decide whether to promote an employee or not okay so this could be a realistic employer or it could be an algorithm and both of them could be drawn to the court of law okay so this is the like uh, beauty of this course so here every time i refer to somebody like defendant somebody like a plaintiff okay each of these could be depending on the role could be potentially also an algorithm instead of a physical human being okay so in this case say some uh, like algorithm is deciding like whether a decision should be taken or not okay and the algorithm is seeing enough ground truth that in these cases the decision has been negative say for instance credit scoring if the algorithm is seeing that like for uh, this particular zip code it's always the credit score or the um, the uh, flag uh, that should be assigned with the person asking for the loan should be negative okay or the credit score should be very low okay so so if the algorithm has this evidence from the ground truth then people might say okay so historically this has been true so therefore this should hold so this is very similar to the naturalistic fallacy idea that i was talking of earlier now therefore in this cases actually disparate impact might not be enough to study okay and what is important is to look for disparate mistreatment or basically the misclassification rates for the protected versus the other class okay so rather than looking into the outcomes or the parity in the outcomes what is more important is to look at the misclassification rates and the idea is that the misclassification rate should be balanced to avoid discrimination so we have already come across an example of this remember where there was a huge dis difference in the misclassification rates in the second case study darker female second class case study second case study is a good example which one is a better example the first or the second compass one like uh, black and female defendants were more likely to be misclassified female was that about female and male or was that about black and white the skin color yeah. black black it was on both but i think both uh, but the major, major study was major on major was so yes. recall recall the fpr and fnrs okay so this was high for 
blacks, low for whites. And this was high for whites and low for blacks. OK, so these are the misclassification rates and they were very different for the two classes, the protected class and the other class. OK, and therefore this was a clear case of disparate mistreatment. Now tell me like uh, in the in that ProPublica example, which one do you think is more important to balance the FPR or FNR? False positive because like uh, innocent the, people. Should yes, be so the innocent people should not be convicted, right? So this is more important. Can you think of a real life example where if an R is more important? From all those examples that we have studied so far. Being approved for a loan or something. Absolutely, very good. Approval or of loan or credit scoring. Can you explain to your to your friends why? Because uh, a person might unfairly not get the benefit of the loan. Like we are stealing uh, potential benefits from them that they True. rightfully so basically deserve. Give benefits. To the best extent possible. OK. Fine, so we will stop here and next week we will start off with notions of biases. Any questions from this part? No, sir. OK. Yeah. Do you have any question? No. OK, so we stop here.